Uh, and Wayne said it. <laughs> Y'all planned it? All right. What book are we studying? Deuteronomy. All right. Uh, good. And we made it to which chapter in Deuteronomy? Chapter 11. Uh, and I'm looking to see if that's where we are because I'm still in numbers for some reason. I can't get my Bible to open correctly. Um, we are in chapter 11. And so, and we started it however long ago. And I said, and, I, and, and we'll just do a kind of a quick recap. Y'all remember what I said? There are, there are two things that are kind of the focus points of this chapter. If you were to sum this chapter up uh, with these two things, what would they be? Who are, anybody remember what they are? Love and obey. Love and obey. That when you study this chapter, uh, it's about love and obey. And Bob, uh, I don't know about you, but this chapter, uh, and it, it just really has some good stuff in it, brother, uh, as we dive into it. Uh oh. It says he is. The light is on, but no one's home. No one's home. Anybody can see over there. Any, everyone look over there at, our, at the shoebox house. Look at all those youth over there working, cleaning up. You should see there's 20, 20 of our youth over there working, cleaning up the, the shoebox branches and stuff. It's really neat. love him uh, uh man bob i uh when i asked you two or three weeks ago what one word would you say sums it up and you said love but honestly doesn't that isn't it exactly what what w w is asked of us just in our everyday christian walk is just to love him just to love him Hey, we're going to use this silver one. Hey, uh, Kevin, he's going to, oh, you're on now. Oh, the gray one is on. Sorry, the gray one's on. There you go. Brother. All right. Thank you. So, and it tells us to love him. So without love him, and we have to have a passion for that. <clears throat> and hopefully, maybe I can talk to you a little bit about the, the hope story, your hope story, and how God has loved you and the hope that you have within you today. <clears throat> Craig mentioned as we were setting out uh, front here about hope, about people not having hope. But we all, all believers, have a hope story that is within us that we can share and give hope to somebody else. Your hope can change the hope of someone else. And hopefully as we get into this, I'm going to talk a little bit about... Do you want to do it now? Uh, do you want to do it now uh, before we dive in? Because I think what you're talking about, especially with what has happened in Northwest Arkansas, it might be really important that we don't miss it tonight. Okay. And so do you just want to start there, or do we need to get to a certain place in the text? Well, we could start there. Let's start, <laughs> where, let's start well, there. Let, yeah, let me just tell this story here about the Titanic, and it kind of, kind of gives you an analogy of how we should look at uh, the lost unbelievers those that are floundering, that we need to rescue. The Titanic sank in April 15, 1912, on its maiden voyage, four days out, and it hit an iceberg. 1,500 people perished in that. 700 survived. They had 20 lifeboats, and which was, would save about half of the people about... 1,200, but they only saved 700. 
Some of those lifeboats were only half full and people were in the water with life vests on screaming for help and those boats rowed away. That sounds like Christians to me mm. that are safe in their boat and rowing away from the loss when they could have rowed up to them and reached down, give them their hand and pull them in the boat. It's really a sad situation when you think about it as to what happened and how that all came about. <coughs> Excuse me. And so from that, uh, the families of the survivors went into what they, to uh, Liverpool to where the office was for the ship. And on that board, they had two boards. One board said, those known saved and those known lost. Mm. And they waited to see where their relatives or kinfolks would show. And do you know how grieved they must have been as they waited, how they prayed, and how they suffered through all of that. And then they would post them, and they waited until theirs showed on one or the other. That's the way we should be looking at the lost. We should be that heart for them, praying for them, speaking to them, giving them our hope story. And we have a hope story, but we sure have a fear of telling that hope story. So, and, and, and in that the event happened to be a pastor. He was a Scottish man. His name was John Harper. And John Harper believed in witnessing. <clears throat> and he did not get in one of the boats. He got a, a vest, light vest, and went into the water. And you, in that frigid water, People lasted anywhere from 15 minutes to about 45 minutes. And he swam around to different people and he asked them, do you believe in Jesus, your Savior? And some would say yes and some would say no. And of course, he witnessed to them there. He came up to this one young man and he asked him, do you believe in Jesus, our Savior? And he said, no, I don't believe. And the wave came along and swept him out away from this guy. Well, in a few moments, he got back to him and he asked him again, do you believe in Jesus our Savior? He said, no, I don't believe. John Harper, the Reverend John Harper, went under the water and lost his life that moment. Six months later, they were having a survivor's meeting in Ontario, Canada, and this young man got up, a Scottish man, and he told about his encounter twice with the Reverend John Harper. He said, I became a Christian that night in that cold water, and he was rescued. And he told a story, and he says, I was the Reverend John Harper's last convert. Mm -mm. So how God works in these ways is, but that's the way we are. We have lost people around us. We have circumstances that maybe, in our, we all have circumstances in our life that we're dealing with right now, whether it's illness or whatever, but you come in contact through those circumstances with other people that are lost. And we tend to center on ourselves. What are we going to do? How can we get out of this? We don't think about going through and Jesus walking with us through it, which is what happened. We think about, what's the easiest way to get out of this? <laughs> but we have those circumstances in our lives that we can use and God intends us to use to witness to people. You've gone through different trials and you know people that have trials that you can relate to, that you can share with, that you can speak to about your hope story. And again, we get our hope story in Jesus, don't we? And we can pass that hope story and change the lives of those that are lost that have no hope. And they have a hope story that is 
harvest. And let me say, if you try to do that out of duty or obligation, it doesn't work. You have to have a passion and a way of life that you hurt for the lost. That you can't help but witness to them. And that's a lifestyle. And we're going to see this. This is what the life lesson is that we're going to see tonight is where when you rise up and when you lie down and when you walk and when you sleep, you're witnessing all the time. You, you're consumed with a passion and a love for Christ. And that's what we want in our lives. So we see how the Titanic and what an analogy that is and those people... Two boats came back after the time. Oh, I might let my phone go out. <laughs> I thought it went off. Uh, two boats came back. One of them picked up three to four people, and one of those died. And they were dying from a hypothermia. And then one of the other boats came back and got six to eight people, and two of those died. So those boats rode off with just about... 60% capacity overall and left those people in the water that was dying. And that's dying. There's so much to that story, brother, that just that thought of, you know, you as a, as a believer in Christ, you're in the boat. How dare us to not try to put somebody in the boat with you? you Be know, so concerned about our own lives. <clears throat> That yeah. we're going to roll away yeah. and leave those people screaming and, and crying. And then those two boards, known lost and known Can saved. Can you imagine standing there and waiting yeah. and waiting and how concerned you are? Why are we not concerned about the lost? But wouldn't it be awesome <clears throat> that if your last conversation on earth was to share the gospel awesome. with somebody? I mean, what a testimony, yeah. that guy. His last conversation yep. was sharing the gospel yes. with somebody. Amen, Amen. brother. Let's, uh, let's get into our study tonight. We're going to pick up, let's, pick up, let's read verses, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 11. Uh, let's read verses 8 and 9. Uh, and I know we looked at that last time, but I think that uh, we should look at it again. Therefore, you shall keep every commandment which I command you today that you may be strong and go in and possess the land which you cross over to possess, and that you may prolong your days in the land which the Lord swore to give your fathers to them and their descendants, a land flowing with milk and honey. How far? Just uh, eight and nine. Okay. Um, hey, in this, in this text, notice what happens right here. Uh, Moses, again, is recapping uh, to this group of people. They're about to cross over into the Jordan. Uh, across over the Jordan into the promised land. And what does Moses uh, do here? First off, what, what takes place in verse number 8? What does he tell him to do? Obey, right? There's two keys to this chapter, and it is what? Love and obey. Love and obey. Here again, we're reminded that it says to obey. But right after that, in verse number 9, what does he start to do in verse number 9? What does he do in verse number nine? That's exactly what my note says. Uh, she must have looked, right? <laughs> she, he reminds them of the promises. Reminds them of the promises. I wonder if sometimes we forget to be reminded of the promises that God has made to us. Now, now, notice this, that it first starts with this obeying, and then he reminds them of the uh, promises. Folks, the obeying, in my opinion, on this side of the cross, is obeying Christ for salvation. And you obey Christ into salvation. Now, I think there's a lot of obeying that takes place, uh, and I'm, I don't want to minimize that, but it starts with you obeying him for salvation. When you repent of your sins, he becomes your Lord and Savior, and from that moment on, you have promises that have been made to you. What are some of those promises that have been made to you as a child of God? What's a promise? 
I will never leave you or forsake you. It doesn't matter if you're on the Titanic and, and you're swimming in cold water. He's not left you nor forsaken you. It doesn't matter if you're in Rogers, Arkansas, and a tree has landed on your roof. He's not. And until the end of the ages. Yeah. What's another promise? I love that verse. I'm so glad. So seldom people talk about that verse right there. But it says that, that he who has began a good work in us is going to complete it in us. He's, he's, he's there to do that for us. And, and that is what a promise that is. Is Hey, Josh, I'm not done with you yet. I'm still going to get, you still got stuff I'm working on, and I'm going to get you there, so let's just keep going down this road together. Psalm 32, 8, and I gave this to my grandson this weekend, uh, the, the promise I claim for him, and that says that I will teach, I will instruct you, and I will teach you in the way that you should go, and I will keep my eye upon you. And that was for him graduating and going off to school. What, what a great, great promise. I will keep my eyes upon you. Now, some of that probably you're like, uh-oh, wait just a minute. <laughs> but that's a great promise. Mm -hmm. What's another promise? We're, yeah, we're destined to be conformed to the image of his son. Now, I don't know about you, but whenever I think about my life right now, I'm like, whoo, that's a long way to go, brother. But that's what he wants in our life, and that's where we're going to get in our glorified life. What else? <laughs> I love it. He's built us a place to live that the wind won't blow away. You know what is amazing? I, I, when I think about heaven, there's so many things that just astonish me. Recently, I've been thinking about the fruit uh, and the trees that are in heaven, I, I, for some reason, that's been on my mind. We've also, Bob, you and I have talked about the color of heaven, but I still can't get past that there's no shadow. When I look right here, I see my shadow every time I move. In heaven, there's no shadows. There is no shadows in heaven. There's no sun. Yeah. The S-O-N, but not the S-U-N. But, folks, that's, isn't that cool to think that there's no shadows in heaven? The glory of the Lord is all around. So he starts this conversation with them about remembering the promises. So he says, hey, obey. And then he starts reminding them of the promises. Folks, and, and I'll tell you again, the, the scripture is full of promises God has made to you as a child of God. In fact, I'll tell you, you will never uh, get all of the promises that he has inside this book. You will never find them all. I think there are so many promises in there. You can study this and study this and study this and still come one day and go like, huh, there's another promise that God has made to me. But look at what happens in verses 10 and, uh, 10 and 11. And so uh, I think it's 10. Let's go ahead and read 10 through 12. Uh, because remember now, he told them to obey, and then he started telling them about promises. And so he talked about this uh, place flowing with milk and honey. Now verse number 10. For the land which you go to possess is not like the land of Egypt from which you have come, where you sowed your seed and watered it by foot as a vegetable garden. But the land which you cross over to possess is a land of hills and valleys, which drinks water from the rain of heaven, land for which the Lord your God cares. The eyes of the Lord your God are always on it from the beginning of the year to the very end of the year. <laughs> I don't know if you know what this meant to this group of people. But do you know that they've, they've been wandering around out in the desert for 40 years? Do you know how hearing these words probably to them was the same thing as me standing here telling you about how wonderful heaven's going to be? 
them hearing those words would be like me saying, Bob, do you know what, what the, the fruit is going to taste like in heaven? I mean, have you thought about that? I ate some watermelon today, and I thought that watermelon really tasted good. But do, have, have you thought about a place where you don't get a sunburn? Or where the sea is like crystal. I mean, you, we've seen beautiful water. Can I tell you something? I think that what we're about to experience. So, so do you know that the people hearing these words right here is the same thing as me telling you about heaven? What they were like, wow. Now, notice what it said there. Bob pointed this out to me. Uh, uh, Bob, I, I'm going to give you credit, but you can go ahead and talk about it if you want to, brother. It was not like Egypt. What does it say? They did their irrigations in the Nile, so they had to haul that. And that's what he's talking about here. He says, for the land which you go to that is not like the land of Egypt, which, from which you have come, where you sowed your seed and watered it by foot as a vegetable garden. But the land which you cross over to possess is a land of hills and valleys, which drinks water from the rains of heaven. God is going to give them water. <laughs> They don't have to depend on oil and water to satisfy their hunger and thirst. God is going to bring them water. Folks, now I love that thought right there. In fact, I underlined it in my scripture. It says that that little thing there right there says uh, it by foot. They watered it by foot. Folks, they had to, everything that they watered, they had to do it by foot. And they're like, you don't have to do that anymore. Folks. That, to me, is what I have to look forward to getting to whenever I arrive at heaven. What he's saying right here is God is supplying everything that you need. It's going to be provided by God. But it runs north. You mentioned that. You said the rain from the south, from the Victoria Lake down to the, it runs actually north, and that's where they get their water. <laughs> it's interesting. Um, when Candy and I were in Israel, we got to see these aqueduct, aqueducts uh, that were built thousands of years ago, and that was the only way for them to transport water. It is really amazing. Yeah, and all the work that they had to do just to get water so that they could survive. And God is telling them, you don't have to worry about that anymore. Doug, that's exciting. If you were this group of people hearing that, do you know that you would have shouted for joy? It's the same thing we should do when we stop and think about heaven. You should never stop shouting for joy for the destination that you are headed to. It's a promise of God. Here's another promise he said. He said, no one can pluck you out of my hand. Folks, if you're a child of God, your destination in heaven is secure. So guess what? You can stand here today and be more assured of going to heaven than they were of walking into this promised land that was flowing of milk and honey. That's good news, brother. It is, and then verse 12. Did she read that? Yeah, she read it. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah a land for which the Lord your God cares. He cares about that land. <laughs> and the eyes of the Lord your God are always on it from the beginning of the year to the very end of the year. <laughs> What a promise of God. 
What a promise. He absolutely does. Um, All right, let's keep going. Uh, Let's read verse number 13. Because what does it say in verse number 13? Anybody want to guess? No, let's go ahead and read it. Verse number 13. And it shall be that if you earnestly obey my commandments, which I command you today, to love the Lord your God and serve him with all your heart and with all your soul. Hey, by the way, if you were to recap this book with two words, what would those two words be? Love and, love obey. and obey. Love and obey. Isn't that exactly what verse number 13 said? Was it exactly what verse number 1 said, which we've already read multiple times inside this text? It says to obey. obey. Now, did you notice something that it, 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 um, it changes a little bit in verse number 13? Did anybody notice a subtle little change that it says in verse number 13? Okay, it did say serve him, and yes, I almost talked about that, uh, but that wasn't what I want you to notice. It did, it did flip them. It flipped them, and so, yeah, there was love, and then obey, and then it's obey, and then and love. Betty, what were you saying? If. Okay, I do like that, uh, the if part, because there is, there is a requirement on the children of Israel to do this uh, for this to happen but that's still not it there's a subtle there's something else that happened inside this text anybody else it okay really close but look at the obey part what does it add at the obey part earnestly earnestly it adds this word earnestly obey Bob while ago whenever you were talking Uh, and you were telling that story, Uh, you said you can't do this out of obligation. You do it out of your passion. To me, that's what this is saying right here. And earnestly obeying is, is something that I'm not doing it as a checklist. I'm doing it out of a, out of sincerity inside my heart. Uh, Do you see it the same way? Yeah. So, you know, that's the way our life should be. And why is that important? Let me just read a verse for you here. And this is out of Revelation 12, 11. And this talks about, and let me read this to you. And I'll read 10 so you'll get the gist of the story. Now, 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 where is it? Revelation 12. Revelation chapter 12. Verses 10 and 11. Verses 10 and 11. salvation, the strength of the kingdom of our God, and the power of, of his Christ has come for the ac- accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. Now listen to this. And they overcame him by how? By the blood of the lamb. The word of their testimony. And by the word of who? Their testimony. Their testimony. Their testimony. So did you care for that one for you? Yes, it is. Your testimony is important. And they did not know they were all sons of God. I, 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 man, that verse, that verse number 11 uh, is such a key, brother, I think. So that's why we should pray that God gives us a passion for the lost. Uh, your testimony um, is, is, is one of the most important important and powerful things that you can use where you can testify to somebody about you coming to a sal- a salvation experience with the Lord. Right. And that's one thing people can't argue with you. They might argue about your beliefs. They may argue about your church. They may argue about your religion, but they cannot argue with your testimony because it's personal. It's you speaking to them. They can't pin that on you. That's right. That's the way you say it. This is the way I was, and this is how God changed me. And the the only thing in between was Jesus. (laughs) 
in, in fact, I was going to ask, what does that word earnestly mean to you? Uh, what you described, I think, is, is one that I was hoping that we were going to get to. It's a, it's a diligence. It's a con- consistency. It's a steadfastness uh, to it. I think there's a purity of heart in it as well, uh, being pure of heart. Did you look up that word, uh, brother, in the... Yeah. <laughs> Pay attention and obey what's said. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's look at verses. Uh, uh, where were we at? We're ready for 14 through 17. Okay. Then I will give you the rain for your land in its season, the early rain and the later rain, and you may gather in your grain your new wine and your oil. And I will send grass in your fields for your livestock that you may eat and be filled. Take heed to yourselves, lest your heart be deceived and you turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. Lest the Lord's anger be aroused against you and he shut up the heavens so that there would be, there be no rain. And the land yield no produce and you perish quickly from the good land which the Lord is giving you. Um. And Betty, a while ago, when we were talking about verse number 13, you said that word if. Uh, and now you see another word. What's the word that you see in, in this passage? Then. If you do this, then this will happen. And when I was in, in high school, computers were just like, we were just learning about those. And the only thing that I could learn to write was an if-then statement. I'm sure that's People don't even know what that means now, but you had an if-then statement, and I had to practice it um, on a computer. Um, but an if-then statement, it, you, it was, hey, if, th- if this happens, then this is going to happen. And that's what he, he outlines here in these two, in this passage is, if you do this, and what is the if you do? What, what are you to do? Obey and love. If you obey and love him, then he's going to do this. Then he goes on to describe if they don't. And what was the change that caused the if they don't? Verse number 16. Take heed to your cease to yourself, lest your hearts be deceived. Folks, that, that phrase right there is the if you don't. So you if, then, and then there's a if you don't. And the if you don't starts with, where, where does it, the if you don't, where does it start? In your heart. In your heart. Man, that heart's a hard thing, brother. Scripture says it's, it's wicked and deceitful, and, and who can even know it? Well, you see what God gave him, not only these things that he's talking about, but he's talking about the rain, and then he talks about the grain, the wine, the oil, and he's going to send grass. He's taking care of your cattle, your livestock, so you're blessed throughout. That blesses. When you're blessed, other people are blessed. And animals. I mean, it's, it's, it's his whole his whole being. And we saw that in Job, you know, to where his whole life, everything he did was blessed. I do think, though, uh, and and it's not one for one, but but I do think that what he's saying to the nation here that hey if you follow my what I command you and need you to do then you as a nation will be blessed. Right. And we see that in Leviticus twenty six is a list of them. Deuteronomy twenty eight is a list. It also has a first thing in sixteen if you don't. So this is a condition conditional. Whereas some of God's promises are unconditional. Some of the things he promised to Abraham were unconditional. Will happen. Unconditional will happen regardless. But these are conditional. If you will follow me and love me and obey me, then you will receive these blessings. If you cannot do that, you're not being blessed. Now, we don't do it to be blessed. We do it because we love him. It's the love that drives everything. Um, and, and 
whenever I, and, and I, I'm not trying to be political, I don't want this to turn anything political, but whenever I read this, and I know that it's talking about the nation of people, and it says, least your heart be deceived, and, and you turn aside and serve other gods and worship them, uh, man, I just can't help but think about what happened to the nation of Israel because they fell into this, but also into our own nation. Not that our, our nation has ever been a perfect nation because we haven't, but the things that we are doing now are so far aside from the truth of what's inside God's word. Back whenever scripture was literally taught, I, I read some stories about our founding fathers uh, that had to, to memorize the gospel of John in school. They had to memorize the gospel of John in English and in Latin, I think it was. But there was two languages that they, I was like, wow. No wonder they wrote a constitution with such big words. Well, Moses Amen? I mean, I was like. Moses is going to get to that in Deuteronomy 12, 8. But it's also in Judges 17, 6, and Judges 24 and 25. Every man did that was right in his own eyes. Our nation are guided by men who think they are doing right in, based on their knowledge. And what is in the world? All that's in the world, what is it? The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and pride of life. So when they make a decision, it is goes right back to the, that's how they make the decision. That's how unbelievers make decisions, are those three things. It's a desire to know, the desire to possess, and the desire to impress. Yeah. determine what truth is and they're trying to apply that based on their own grace. They think they're being merciful. They think they're being tolerant. We're intolerant. <laughs> so they go through all of that and believe that because they're doing what is right in their own eyes. And when that happens and in scripture like that there was trouble in River City. Trouble. <laughs> Wait. Curtis? Curtis? Yeah, it, it, and, and great point, Curtis, that it's a foreshadowing, it's a warning that is out there uh, that, hey, this is going to happen. I, I actually, honestly, I think that part of what's going on with our nation today is back in the uh, late 50s, early 60s, I don't think there were enough uh, people warning about what's going to happen and some of the things that took place with taking prayer out of school, allowing abortion. I mean, if you look at 1960, uh, about 1961 to about 1965, 66, some of the laws that were changed are absolutely what is driving everything that's happening today in our land. And, and you can you can actually go back and just track um, the history of our nation. And I wonder if there weren't people, I wasn't alive, so it's easy for me to point fingers at people back then, but say, I wonder if there weren't, there, the pastors of that day were not warning the nation, you, hey, you're going the wrong place, you're going the wrong place. Maybe they were and they were ignored, because Moses warned them and they were ignored too, so it could be. Uh, but in my opinion, those from about 1961 to about 1965, 66, somewhere in there, there was a lot that changed. Uh, I was a senior in high school in 62. I remember that. You remember it, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um. Pulling people in, yeah. Yeah, it goes down to what Curtis said, you know, these churches that are, are adopting doctrine, they're, they're, they're in a boat, they think, but they're pulling people into a boat that's sinking because they're teaching them false doctrines and false teachings. And so, all right, any other thoughts, questions, Wayne?
Yeah. Mm. The righteous will see their fall. Yeah. Uh, boy, I pray we do. Anyone else? Doug? The, oh, wow. That's the beginning of spiritual adultery. Yeah. It is. Yeah, when your heart is deceived. And by the way, that's when all adultery takes place is when your heart is deceived. Anyone else? All right. If not, let's have a word of prayer and we'll be dismissed. Father, Lord God, thank you so much for this evening. Uh, this time we can come and study your word. We're thankful for your word. And Father, the promises that you have in it, the way that we can uh, dive into it and see the depth of what you have. Even if it's something uh, as simple as your promises or that if we don't, what the consequences could be. Father, I ask that you'll help us to take uh, tonight's lesson and apply it to our heart. Uh, the story, Father, of the Titanic, how we can even apply that to our own lives. To, to be witnesses for you with a passion, Father, that cannot be shut up. Um, because we have such a desire for people uh, to be saved. Oh, Father, let us be that. Let us be the light in this dark and dying world. Father, we do continue to pray for everyone that is uh, trying to recover from uh, the tornadoes that came through. We ask that you'll have your hand upon them. Be with the ones that are working. Uh, Father, be with the ones that are being evangelists out there, too, sharing the love of Christ. Let them do it with a, with a passion, but, Father, with a love in their heart uh, for you and for the people. Oh, Father, may you change lives through this. We ask this all in the name of our Lord, our Savior, Jesus, the Christ. Amen.